Warning, the video you're about to watch does contain spoilers. You have been warned. I'm the doctor. Never be cruel. Fantastic. Never be cruel. First, the polarity of the neutron. Have you ever thought what it's like? You want those in the fourth dimension? Doctor Who, The Empire of Death was written by Russell T. Davies and directed by Jamie Donoghue, and is the eighth and final episode of season one. Continuing on from the legend of Ruby Sunday, the Doctor's old enemy, Sutek, the God of Death, has been let loose, unleashing complete devastation across all of existence. The Doctor, Ruby, and Mel must stop Sutek before all of creation is consumed by his power. So we're finally here at the end of the first season of Shooty Gatwa, as the Doctor. The ultimate rematch between Sutek and the Doctor, and this is how it ends. A lot of build-up from the Legend of Ruby Sunday, only for it to be, well, a bit disappointing. Starting off from the beginning of the episode where Sutek releases his dust of death, and everyone is dying and turning into dust that I liked, showcasing how powerful Sutek is as he destroys the world, all that stuff I thought was really great. I mean, you know all this is going to be undone and everyone will come back, no one's going to really die. And then we cut to Kate Stewart and everyone is dying around her all the unit soldiers, and then she dies not before having time to say some final speech because everyone has to have a final speech before they die. Then the Doctor and Mel head back to Ruby, who's still in the time window, and then Ruby uses the projection of the time window and her memory of the TARDIS projection from the VHS tape to make the TARDIS real and tangible. And before they escape, in the memory TARDIS they come face to face with Sutek, and this is where we get into a proper explanation to how Sutek has returned and who the Susan Triad characters all are. So how how did Sutek, the last of the Osirans, survive from the ending of the Pyramids of Mars, where the Doctor trapped him in the Time Vortex? I moved the threshold of a time-space tunnel into the far future. He could never have reached the end. Well, Sutek latched himself to the TARDIS, allowing him to escape. Basically, every adventure since the Pyramids of Mars, Sutek has been holding on to the TARDIS, but the TARDIS has only been making this groaning sound since, what, the 60th anniversary? Okay, I guess I can go along with that. So Sutek was linked to the TARDIS and creating every single version of Susan Triad by using the TARDIS's perception filter. So anywhere the TARDIS landed, a version of Susan Triad was created and they were all called Susan because Sutek being linked to the TARDIS, he knew the name of the Doctor's granddaughter and used that as, I don't know, I guess like kind of a calling card? But these countless versions of Susan Triad, or as Sutek calls them, his angels of death, were essentially real people created by Sutek every time the Doctor landed somewhere since the Pyramids of Mars. But why? So Sutek can use them to release his dust of death and destroy all life in the universe. So he's practically just using them as pawns. Okay, I can buy into that, that's fine. But the Doctor, Ruby and Mel escape from Sutek in the memory TARDIS and witness the slow demise and destruction of all creation. And then I'm not quite sure how much time has passed then, because the next scene is with the Doctor now on this dead planet for some reason that I still don't understand why. And he talks to this woman and asks her for some metal and she gives him a spoon. So he can then put that piece of metal in the TV screen so we can have some more flashback sequences to the Pyramids of Mars. Now I have absolutely no idea if this scene on this planet directly ties into the Tales of the Tardis, because I haven't seen it and there's nowhere for me to watch it in Australia. And I, th and I think that's most likely the same for us international fans. But the stuff in the memory Tardis, I wasn't a fan of that anyway. It just, it it felt so cheap, like, like, remember this Doctor Who episode? And remember when the Doctor had a multicolored coat? Remember when the Doctor wore question marks on his jumper? Hey, remember Ghostbusters? Oh, I remember. Remember Slimey? Slimey. It's just nostalgia that's everywhere, and I, I feel like it works for those individual Tales of the TARDIS episodes, because that's a way of getting new viewers to experience classic Doctor Who, editing it together into, like, a feature-length movie version with new special effects. That's fine. I don't think it works in a proper Doctor Who episode. It just feels very distressing distracting in this set that's constructed of, well, pure nostalgia. And then there's some explanations that tie into the unanswered questions in 73 yards, or at least some of them. The whole thing of the TARDIS perception filter projecting a 73 yard field around itself, and the Doctor says, funny things happen at 73 yards, people say you can see things. So was Ruby in the episode 73 yards actually seeing something the TARDIS was projecting, or possibly Sutek was projecting, or was she actually seeing her future self? Let me know in the comments below, because I still have 
absolutely no idea. But anyway, back to the monitor screen, Ruby starts to see footage of Roger App Gwilliam when he was Prime Minister in 73 Yards. Somehow, even though that was all undone and it never actually happened anyway. But why does she see Roger App Gwilliam? Well, because the doctor says Roger App Gwilliam in the year 2046 makes compulsory DNA testing for the entire population. So the doctor takes the TARDIS to the year 2046 so we can finally know who Ruby's mother is. Why? Because they work out that Sutek hasn't killed them yet because of this explanation and, um, uh, yeah, I think this is really dumb. Because Sutek is insanely curious and wants to know who Ruby's mother is. Yeah, this all-powerful being is baffled by that and is so desperate to know the answer. So they find out who Ruby's mother is, but it's not revealed to the audience yet. And Mel then completely is taken over by Sutek, and then she brings the Doctor and Ruby to Sutek herself. And then Sutek is like, you know, give me the name, I want to know who Ruby's mother is. And then Ruby swings a rope around Sutek's neck, and the Doctor summons the actual real TARDIS this time with a whistle and, and attaches the rope to the interior of the TARDIS and drags Sutek through the time vortex, and this kills him. And I guess Sutek, because he was outside the TARDIS field, that's how he died? I find it really hard to believe that this all-powerful being was defeated by essentially rope. I mean, yeah, okay, whatever, it's intelligent rope from the church on Ruby Road. The whole thing with Ruby's mother, to me, that just made no sense. Like, if she was just some ordinary random woman, what the hell causes the snow to magically appear whenever Ruby thinks of the church on Ruby Road, Christmas Eve 2004? That to me is still unclear. And why was she wearing this mysterious cloak, you know, looking very ominous? And the whole thing with her choosing Ruby's name by pointing at the sign that said Ruby Road? Why would she be pointing at a sign if there was no one there? That whole sequence, you know, I thought it made no sense. All this build up to this mysterious woman who's Ruby's mother and it's pretty much a cheat ending. And if you enjoyed that moment where the Doctor says your mum was special because she was ordinary and, and Ruby then gets reunited with her biological mother, that's fine. I can see how that scene would convey a lot differently to some people and I'm glad you were taken by it, but I just couldn't buy into the fact that the whole season they're building up to this mysterious thing, this something that turns out to be nothing but an ordinary woman. Overall thoughts? I think the episode was stupendously directed. The visual effects I thought looked fantastic. Looking at the story as a whole combining the legend of Ruby Sunday and the Empire of Death together. The first part being a whole lot of build-up and exposition and the reveal of Sutek, it was good, but you could see they were trying to go for the same sort of thing with the Master's reveal in Utopia. I don't think it's as impactful as that scene, but but I thought it was still effective. I still don't know why Sutek couldn't have had green eyes, and that's just the fanboy in me talking, I know, but um, I would have much preferred if he had green eyes. I like the fact that Sutek actually wins and he wipes out pretty much all of creation. And of course it is undone, but I like the fact that the Doctor fails. This was one of the main focuses of the first half of the episode, showcasing the Doctor's failure actually causes this. The whole thing with Mrs. Flood at the end, I mean, and that's gonna be something probably in season two, I, I have no idea. I think there's a whole lot of characters in this that still serve almost no purpose. Rose Noble, the Vlinks, I really don't buy into this young Sheldon genius in, as unit scientific advisor, even if it was caused by a passing asteroid. There's just a whole lot of people people in this that I feel like they just served as background characters and serve no actual purpose to the plot. The portrayal of Unit in general as well in the RTD2 era, I'm not a big fan of. Just look at how everyone greets the Doctor in The Legend of Ruby Sunday. Like, it all feels so casual, like you've just knocked off work and you're meeting up with friends down at the pub. Like, all their previous formalities have completely gone out the window. I like Shooty. Overall, in both episodes, I think Mel was handled really well. She was actually given something to do and not just reduced to being a background character. But I think the story's second half, The Empire of Death, is weaker than The Legend of Ruby Sunday. I think there's quite a lot of holes within The Empire of Death and things that still, to me, don't make a whole lot of sense. It was cool to see Sue take back, but I don't think there's enough of him in the episode. And the way that that he was defeated I thought was ridiculous. I mean, rope. But is it a worthy follow-up to the Pyramids of Mars? Maybe for some, but most definitely not for me. It has its moments here and there, but I don't think it reaches the highs of the Pyramids of Mars. I mean, there's a reason why that story is called an absolute classic. The episode is more of a mixed bag for me, and I'm going to give The Empire of Death a 6 out of 10. But let me know in the comments below what you thought of The Empire of Death and what you thought of Season 1 in general. I would greatly appreciate if you gave the video a like, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. You can follow me on my socials, which will be in the links in the description down below. And as always, you've been watching The Who View. I hope to see you next time, but bye for now. <laughs>